As always with these activity ideas, don't forget that we are very much still working on a lot of the previous activities that are in the older videos, remembering that every child is going to develop at their own pace and every child has something that they're more interested in and something that they need a little bit more help with. In case you've missed them, I do have a full video on all sorts of different matching activities that I'm not going to go over again in this video, as well as all the different ways that we can allow our child to explore the world while being outside, especially now that the weather is nice. So there's additional activity ideas in those two videos and I'll go ahead and link them for you as well. As our little ones approach that two year mark, you may notice them become a lot more independent in actually selecting activities and trying to set them up themselves. It may be that they're not so much interested in actually completing the activity, but just trying to imitate how you presented the activity for them. One matching variation that we hadn't discussed before is item to silhouette matching, which is quite a bit more difficult than the picture to silhouette matching. So definitely reserve this for the child that has completed and mastered that original version first. Now, as I've said, we're definitely still working on a lot of similar activities that we have been up until this point, but our child's fine motor skills are definitely becoming a lot more refined. So even something as simple as this clothespin and basket activity, it's still something that we can revisit and simply allow our child a lot more autonomy and independence in figuring out how to do this on their own, maybe guiding them here and there, but really allowing them to work on those fine motor skills. Another fine motor work that you may be familiar with is posting toothpicks, which is a lot more fine motor work than any other type of posting that we've done up until now. If you've got an actual container for the toothpicks, it's definitely going to be even more of a challenge than this sesame seed shaker, but that's all that we had on hand. And the reason we're revisiting so many of the fine motor works is because so many of the activities that we're working on now really necessitate control of those fine motor skills. You've seen me talk about this house that is practicing lock and key several times on this channel before, but it is just now that Stella's fine motor skills are refined enough to actually get that key in, turn it and be able to stop in time instead of continuously turning it back and forth. Now you can also do this with just one simple lock and one simple key that are going to be large enough for your child not to be a choking hazard, but Stella prefers this version that also allows for some pretend play and imaginative play as she gets to play with the little people that get to hide inside the houses, lock them, and then open them back up. When we last spoke, I recommended introducing either tweezers or tongs to see if your little one is interested in transferring with them. You'll notice I ended up switching to the different type of tweezer. These are actually tongs, and this is what actually sparked that interest for Stella. So if you still haven't tried a different variation, I encourage you to do that and see if a different version that is going to be easier for your child to handle might actually spark that interest. As for what they actually transfer, it will really depend on your little one and what you've got lying around the house. We have pom-pom balls, and Stella's quite interested in those, you'll notice she is transferring from a bowl to a little paint palette that I got at the Dollar Tree because that I found she's much more interested in versus just transferring from bowl to bowl. This way she's also working on some one-to-one -one correspondence and sometimes I'll just set up three different pairs of colors so she's also doing some color matching there. But the hand strength they need to actually be able to control those tongues or tweezers is exactly what we'll need to move on into some scissors work later. Another phenomenal way to strengthen their little hands and their little fingers, really work on those fine motor skills and also some language development development is through finger play. So something along the lines of this little pig went to the market. This is something that was incredibly commonplace when I was growing up and I don't see it talked about quite enough. If your child is progressing in their speaking journey, you may have noticed that they're very interested in actually trying to sing along on their own. And when we combine that with some kind of finger movement, now we're working on language development as well as refining those motor skills. Personally, I love to invite Stella to partake in some finger play right before we get working with either Play-Doh or modeling clay because it really warms up her hands and gets her ready for a lot of fine motor movement. I've mentioned it before in my creativity in Montessori video, but allowing her child to explore something after we have modeled to them what is possible is the best way to really cultivate their creativity. So Stella has seen me carve out little triangles and little squares with all the tools that we have. She's seen me try to roll the Play-Doh out without really calling attention to it. I was simply playing along right next to her. You'll notice that's what she's really enamored with trying to do with her Play-Doh now. The same goes for this activity. This is something that we did just once and she has picked up on it and has been really enamored with trying to replicate that activity time and time again. We were making different footprints of different animals and talking about hooves versus paws and all the different ways that different animals walk. We've tried matching them. We've also tried looking at which ones are bigger versus smaller between the large animal versus the baby animal. And after a quick cleanup break, let's move along into modeling clay, which is going to be a bit more difficult to use than Play-Doh because it definitely requires a lot more hand strength, but it opens up a lot of new opportunities for us. 
simply trying to mold the clay, get it to be warm and soft enough to mold, having to roll it out. That is going to require a lot more strength from our child, but they're also going to see a lot more feedback from what they're doing with the clay because it pushes back a lot more. So now it's not just squeezing under their hands, it's actually forming into something. Just like with the Play-Doh, I like to sit next to Stella and simply create something and see if she'll pick up on it. I'll pick a technique, something like pinching the clay and see if she'll pick up on that as well. You'll see here that she did. So I was pinching away at the clay and with that, I was able to make a little rose with some leaves and some petals and she's here trying to recreate her own version of it. Or here she's trying to recreate the snail I made where I just rolled out the clay and rolled it on itself to make a little snail. You can see that she's having to really control her fingers in new and different ways. This is a wonderful way to do some creative play, some pretend play, as well as really refine those fine motor skills. Now, if you find that your child's hands are strong enough and they have an interest, you can slowly start to introduce scissor work. You can see we started off with some incredibly safe first plastic scissors. These actually require a lot of work on our part to get to work. So we have to hold the paper as the adult on both sides. So it's nice and tight. You can see I had a hard time actually filming her using these scissors, but these scissors will cut paper with our help, but they won't cut anything else. Once we got the actual technique down and Stella knew the safest way to handle scissors, I went ahead and introduced safe, blunt tip scissors, but they are actual scissors now. Obviously supervised, this doesn't stay on her shelf, but this is something that we will sometimes sit together and do when she asks to work with scissors. If you're finding that your child is interested, but they're having a hard time opening and closing the scissors themselves, this is where that tweezer work, those tongs works are really going to help them strengthen those same muscles that they need to be able to open and close the scissors. Now switching gears a little bit here, this is a kind of activity that you can either set up during bath time, or you can take this outside in the warm months when you're playing with water this one was even interesting for me to figure out because every single tube has its own unique quirk some of them pour the water straight through some of them pour the water very slowly some of them you have to tilt just right to get water to pour out so this takes a lot of practice and a lot of trial and error to get the water to actually flow the way that you want it to flow so all that trial and error and seeing how the water moves and how powerful the water can be or how easily we can slow it down are really early stem findings and sticking with the science experimentation for a bit longer, this is a simple variation of a big versus small activity that we set up, which is essentially creating big and small houses for big and small animals that we've got. So here we're not only working on building something, we're also working on predicting when something will be large enough to actually contain the item that we're building for. So in this case, we really had to work hard to create something that would be large enough to fit that swan. We also talked about how the mouse, for example, could easily fit into its own smaller house and into the large house for the swan. The swan, on the other hand, could certainly fit into its large swan house, but would not be able to fit into the small house for the mouse. And this is what a more traditional big versus small activity would look like, which is a tray of large and small items. Now we're working on miscellaneous items that may not be the exact same size, but we've simply got a variety. Items that are larger and items that are smaller. So this is taking a lot more cognitive recognition of trying to understand which items are actually big in this setting versus items that are small. And as we progress, we can add a third option, which would be medium. So then we will be working on distinguishing between big, medium, and small items. Another variation for sorting into different categories would be something like animals versus food. Here I actually set this up with three baskets. So one contained the mixed items, one was for the animals, and one was for the food. Now our child is trying to find what it is that makes these items the same as each other and what makes them different from the other category of items. So if you notice that your child is capable of categorizing items that are quite different, well, maybe we can make this even more complex. Here we're categorizing land animals from aquatic animals. We didn't just dive into the sorting and categorizing right away. We did a bit of a unit study. We took out our books, we took out some photographs, we took out the figurines, and we started to look at how the aquatic and the land animals are different. I asked Stella to point out where the legs and the arms are for a seal, for example, and she noticed that they look very different on a seal than they do on her and that the legs of a giraffe for example look different as well and this is where she started to understand that there's something similar about some of these animals and those are the aquatic animals and that a different category of them are the land animals that have the legs that they can actually walk on notice your child making those observations then they're ready to start categorizing another activity that i've recently introduced is a very simplified version of a memory game where i present either two or three sets of pictures for stella and i I lay them out 
Sometimes I don't even mix them up, I just lay them out in pairs. Sometimes I'll mix up just one of the items. And I've been showing her the concept of how the memory game works because just understanding how that game works itself is difficult enough. But because I've noticed Stella retelling stories of what had happened several days ago, I realized that her memory is working pretty well. So I wanted to see if she's actually interested in testing it out with this activity. And she's pretty fascinated by it. If your child is incredibly interested in language and has been showing interest in trying to understand what the letters actually are and has been capable of recognizing beginning sounds, you may start introducing that to them. Here we're just working on separating items that start with the sound s and the sound a. Ah. And because we are obviously speaking in Russian, the items are very different from what you might expect them to be. We can also work on some pre-writing skills, just getting our hands ready to move up and down or left to right, just being able to control the direction that we want our hands to move. At first, I'm offering Stella an opportunity to do this with an eraser, essentially erasing away the lines that I made. This follows the same logic as the movable alphabet. When we're trying to write something, we're making something pretty permanent, and if we make a mistake, it's very glaring. But if we're using the movable alphabet or we're simply erasing, it's not quite as intimidating. You may be familiar with the fact that in Montessori, we prefer to offer the child the opportunity to simply create something instead of coloring in coloring books. But there is something to be said about the control that a child needs to actually color within something. The same kind of control that they need to, for example, connect two lines. Again, all wonderful pre-writing skills if your child is actually interested in exploring them. Stella has been really drawn to her crayons, so this is how I set up her activity. But you can also start with a sandbox tray, which is again a lot less intimidating because we can simply shake the sand around and start all over. Let's pivot to the pretend play and open-ended play area for a little bit. Something that I can't recommend enough is getting some kind of vet set or a doctor play kit. Something that will allow your child to really explore these items that they often feel very intimidated by when we visit the doctor. She enjoyed trying these items on herself on me as well as on all of her animals and this time when we visited the doctor she wasn't scared because she recognized each and every item that was there she had had the opportunity to explore what they are and what they will do so she knew exactly what to expect now when we're building similar to the coloring it is definitely more beneficial for a child to simply be given a collection of blocks or legos and allow them that opportunity to explore and create on their own but there is something to be said about having guidelines like this and actually figuring out how to follow those guidelines so we're not necessarily being stuck with what we're creating because this set in particular simply allows us different options of what we can do with the blocks that we have and being able to actually follow along these instructions and follow the same pattern it's also quite a difficult concept. What I like about this set is that there's very many different ways that we can utilize the pieces that we do have, and then we can use them all for a lot of pretend play and open-ended play once we have built something. So a set like this actually allows for a lot more imagination because it's given us some instructions on how to build something, and then we can take it from there. If you notice, for example, when Stella went astray and started adding additional flowers, I didn't stop her. But then when she went to add the tree, she found that she wasn't actually able to put it in place the way that the picture showed. So this became its own lesson that I didn't need to point out. She just figured it out on her own. By allowing moments like this to our child where we can show them what is possible, then when we step back, they have a lot more ideas that they can experiment with and a lot more items that they're able to create all on their own. Just like with these mega blocks, all we did was create one simple toilet for her baby dolls because we're working on that potty learning journey and Stella ran with that idea and now she created a little toothbrush with some toothpaste. She set up a little bath for her dolls and she asked us to help her build a sink. She created a whole house because we showed her the possibility of actually incorporating these different variations of play together. And don't forget that we can also incorporate pretend play outside. We can take our baby dolls, strollers, cars, trucks, whatever outside and allow our child to incorporate a lot more gross motor movement while they're also exploring those important benefits of having pretend play. If you're curious to know more about pretend play in the Montessori home, I do have a separate video on that. I've created a lot of different obstacle courses on this channel before and something that we've added now is different colored hacky sacks. Stella is finally jumping, so we're jumping around all the different colors. We can later add things like jump in front or behind to the left or to the right. And if you're constructing some kind of obstacle course for your child, don't forget creating a space where they have to walk around something. Maybe they have to walk under something or maybe they need to crawl over 
and crawl down because that's going to work a lot of different muscles and a lot of different gross motor skills as well. Brings us into the practical life portion. Now, last time we talked about trying to put on their shoes and at this point, your little one just may be completely capable of putting their shoes on on their own. If they are interested in exploring that concept but you see that they need help, wait for them to actually ask for that help and then help as little as possible so they can continue to do it as much on their own as they're willing to do. A lot of the practical life skills that we've been working up until now are still going to be a favorite and we're still going to continue working on them, just like swiffering, dusting, mopping. But maybe now our child is taking that initiative on their own they're completely capable of figuring out what it is that they want to help with and how they can do so. Folding has also become an absolute favorite. And all I did was very slowly show to Stella how to fold in as simple way as possible. Folding up and then folding to the side. And from there, she just picked it up by seeing me fold every single day. And don't underestimate the power of a simple activity like baking, where we're not only introducing a wide variety of new words, we're allowing our child to experience new foods. We're also working on beginning fractions because we're using quarter and half cups. And don't be afraid to actually call these things what they are to your child. They will pick up on it. And if you're working on a recipe that you've done multiple times with your child, see if they remember what's next. See if they remember what kind of cup or spoon they need for certain ingredients. And if your child is ready, you can go ahead and introduce something like a chopper or a child safe nylon knife. Stella's been a huge fan of hers. You can work on something that's very soft, like a banana or a pair when you're first starting out. I encourage you to demonstrate to your child how to roll up their Montessori rug. It's a lot of practice and motor work to actually get it to roll just right and be tight enough to stand up. It can be a pretty exciting way to actually end the work cycle and maybe even end the day. And that wraps up our video. As always, I hope you found some interesting activities for your little one. Until next time, I hope you stay safe.